Hello, and welcome to Monumental, where we sit down with entrepreneurs, leaders, visionaries, and big thinkers making monumental change. Here's your host, Evan Holliday. Welcome to Monumental. I'm your host, Evan Holliday, and today on the show, we have on here Peter Conti. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's great to be with you, Evan, and uh, along here with all of you listening with us today. Yes, yes, I love it. I'm really glad to have Peter on today. Uh, A quick side note, uh, Peter wrote Commercial Real Estate Investing for Dummies, you know, the yellow book, and that really was one of the first books I read in uh, commercial real estate and real estate investing. I think it was in high school when I read it. Uh, So I'm, I'm very grateful for today's interview. I'm really excited to dive in. Uh, So a little bit about Peter before we get started. Peter is an auto mechanic turned real estate investor and self-made millionaire in three and a half years. He started small buying a duplex, a couple of four units and a 12, 24 unit before working his way up to shopping centers and 300 unit complexes. He has mentored thousands of investors all over the world and supported many more through his books, including commercial real estate investing for dummies on multifamily and commercial real estate investing. So with that, Peter, that's, that's pretty impressive be able to climb up like that and, and do massive transactions like that and be able to help people all over the world. Um, let's just dive right into your background. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. It, it, it sounds, sounds like a lot when you put it all together like that, but it was just <laughs> one step at a time. So, Yeah, that's exactly what it takes. Yeah. So, so why don't we go into kind of early stages of, of you growing up and got to where you are today? Well, I, I came from a family with seven kids, and uh, uh, my father was the only one that worked. So, so uh, we were, were a very frugal family, and uh, I, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to grow beyond that. Um, growing up as a kid, the people in my family, my parents would say things like, oh, well, that, that's rich people live over there. And it was almost like this idea that if you had money, it was a bad thing. And uh, One of the big things that I did uh, as part of my process of growing uh, mentally and getting ready to do bigger things financially was uh, open up my mind to the idea that it's okay to have money. You can use money to to really help a lot of people out there. You can do a lot more good in the world with money in a lot of cases than you can without. And one of the things that I listened to along the way was a, it was an audio tape course. I think it's available uh, still now, maybe through Nightingale Conan, called Prosperity Consciousness. It was by a guy named Frederick Learman. And uh, he was one of my, I think of him as a mentor, even though I've never met him in person, that just helped me to shift some of the ideas in my mind and open up to the idea that there's incredible opportunity waiting out there for, for each one of you, if you just only, you know, are willing to reach out and grab onto it. So so that was that was the book that you read that, or you listened to that kind of shape the way that you think today helped helped a lot uh, to be able to to uh, be okay with the idea of of taking on opportunities and having lots of money come into your life um, if you can't get your mind your the right mindset I see people out there who they they say that they want to go do bigger better things but then they haven't changed the internal mindset and because of that they will tend to sabotage or um, just not take action. They'll get part way. I don't know if you know anyone like that. Oh yeah. You know, get part way into a project or get, you know, they've started a hundred different things, but they haven't followed through on anything. Mm-hmm. A lot of times that mindset behind it is that reason. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, it, it's not only, you know, setting the goals, but it's actually like believing in yourself to think that you are, you are that person already and having that a belief in yourself is what helps you get you through those tough times of, you know, you having a setback or, you know, something doesn't quite go your way and you don't just give up and quit and, or try to start over. Yeah. Um, I think it does take a strong mindset and, and it, and it's like anything else. It takes, it takes practice. It's like a muscle. You have to develop that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So yeah, I was working as an auto mechanic and uh, what I did was I went around and visited people that had been in that field for most of their lives. Uh, I got, you know, got to uh, introduce to and talk to people that 
had been a mechanic and maybe they worked their way up where they had their own shop or service station or whatever. And I saw these guys that are, you know, they're my age now. Uh, back then, they were 55, 60 years old. And, you know, they looked kind of tired out and, and uh, uh, just wasn't, wasn't really where I wanted to go. Plus, I, I wanted to do just a lot of fun stuff in, in my life. And I knew that the income that that would produce wouldn't allow me to do that. And so I started, uh, you know, uh, reading books. Um, it was audio tapes I'd listened to back then. I'd go to seminars. We didn't have it easy like folks do nowadays. We can just jump, jump, on, jump on the web and get all this free information that's right. available now or listen to webinars. And, and uh, uh, I basically went out and my first property was a duplex. I, I was scared to death when I bought it. I, I, I knew I knew I wanted to make this change and, and I knew it was the right way for me to go. But at the same time, you know, I, when I'm on the phone calling up people trying to look for properties, I, I'd say, hi, I'm, I'm a real estate investor. And this little voice in my head would say, no, you're not. You're, <laughs> you're not a mechanic. Yeah. And at that closing on that duplex, I was, I was so determined, but at the same time, so scared that I was like physically shaking. And the realtor's name was Don, wonderful guy. He reached over and patted me on the back. He said, Peter, take a deep breath. It's going to be all right. And uh, <laughs> that one duplex, we used to drive by it. And my oldest daughter would say, don't sell that one, dad. That's, that's the one that's going to put me through college. And not only that one property, not only put her through college, but one of her sisters partway as well. So uh, I, w- one of my beliefs about real estate is that you, you don't have to go out and get a thousand units or, you know, 82 different properties. Like you hear these stories from people a lot of times. I know you talk to a lot of people have done, you know, just huge stuff all, all across the country with commercial properties, you know, one or two properties can, can make an incredible difference in your life. And depending on the property, you know, one, two, three or four properties might be all you need to get into to take care of most anything that you want to be able to do with your life. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, um, and I, and I think that's a great perspective of like, hey, you know, and also having the mindset of just saying, hey, start, start with what's right in front of you first. Accomplish right. that first before you start setting goals of, you know, closing 100 properties. Why don't you close the one that's in front of you? Right. Well, for me, I, you know, I made my way into that duplex and everything turned out okay. Um, although I was scared to death, I wouldn't be able to find tenants to make the, it was 800, $811 a month as the payment. I still remember that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I went from that, I thought, well, you know, I'll buy a four unit. I did a two, maybe I can do a four. And then I think I did a seven and a 12 and kind of went up from there. And I think one of the things that's really been different in my investing career is I, I also have just always had a passion to, to teach and share with other people. And I, I think part of that is I, I perform better with someone there kind of watching what I'm doing. It's, it's interesting. I, you know, if I do something on my own, it's fine. But if I can do it with someone watching me to see what I do, I, I like that added extra pressure of, of almost like the challenge of can Peter pull this off? Um, and I, I have a definitely a performing aspect in me as well. I'm actually doing um, imp- improv comedy I've taken up recently that really covers that creative, <laughs> checks, that, <laughs> checks that creative box off for me. But um, I, I found that I really enjoyed being able to help people. I've helped you know, thousands of people all across the country with commercial and residential. We used to do a bunch of stuff with creative buying, lease purchase and stuff like that to get people over that hump of get, you know, getting your first couple of deals done and finding out, wow, this, this isn't just you know, something that happens for other people, but it's something that can happen for, for uh, you as well, for those of you listening to this. So, so after that first deal, uh, what... How long did it take you to get the next deal? Uh, it was a couple of months to get the next deal. Um, what was interesting, wait a minute. No, I, I, the, the, um, between the second and third was a couple of months. But that first one I bought in February. In that year, I'd set this audacious goal of having 100 units in my first year of investing. You know, never bought anything before. Might as well set this oh, yeah. huge goal which I think looking back on that, I think what I was doing was setting a goal that was so big that if I didn't accomplish it, then no one could really fault me for it. It's sort of a, um, 
fail, failing ahead of time sort of mode. I finally figured out, um, I found it's better to set realistic goals that you know that you can reach it. Yes, they're a stretch for you, but not so big that it's just crazy of, you know, hey, I'm going to go to the moon um, yeah. 30 days from now. So I had bought that duplex and basically got that just knowing I wanted to do something and charged out there without really knowing much about real estate investing to get that done. Then the more I learned, the more I realized there was that could go wrong with real estate. And I fell into the, the trap of overanalyzing and, and just getting stuck, the paralysis of analysis. And through that year, I was looking at all kinds of properties. I subscribed to a data service. It's not as good as what they have now, but you know, I could see who bought the property and what they paid for it and what the taxes were. And I'm doing all sorts of calculations on what it's going to take to fix up places and everything. Um, the problem was I didn't have a handle on how to accurately evaluate a commercial property. And because I didn't know how to do that, uh, I mean, it's not that complicated, but I didn't know how to do a cap rate formula, for example. I would either offer such a low price on the property because I was scared of losing that, you know, if you're offering way, way below what's a, a close to a realistic offer, you don't end up getting anything. Um, right. Or I would spend so much time analyzing the property that by the time I was ready to make an offer on it, someone else would already pick it up, especially if it was a good deal. And so it was actually eight months after buying that first duplex that I was sitting down with my life insurance guy. His name was Dan. And he would sit down once a year and basically try and move you from a term policy up to a whole life policy. And so he's asking me questions like, well, Peter, do you, you know, do you really care for your family? Yes, Dan, I do. You know, I, well, how, how are you going to take care of your future? I said, hey, I'm a real estate investor. And he did the Dr. Phil thing with me. He said, okay, how's that going for you? I said, well, I've got a, I've got a duplex. And he goes, okay, Peter, is that, is that really going to be enough? And I recognized in that moment, you know, I'd been doing this stuck needing to take further action or do something different than what I've been doing for eight months. And in that one moment, I realized I've got to do something different. So I said, Dan, again, I'm motivated by kind of challenge and putting myself on the spot. I said, Dan, tell you what, a year from now, when we sit down again, if I haven't got my real estate investing going in a huge way, you can put anything you want in front of me and I'll go ahead and sign it. <laughs> now, I, I think, you know, um, Life insurance is a, a very important thing that all of us should have, especially if you're going to be the one bringing in uh, all the finances for your, your company, as I hope most of you listening to this podcast are. But I don't like an investment that requires me to die in order to pay off. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had been hesitating on getting some help. I had actually met a mentor. His name was Keith um, three or four months before that. But he wanted, get this, he wanted $5,000 to work with him. And I just was... I was looking at that through the eyes of an auto mechanic, $5,000. That's a lot of money when you only make $25,000 a year. Yeah. Um, and I, I finally realized I need to look at that through the eyes of a real estate investor with, you know, a real estate deal, a commercial deal. That's, that's almost a rounding error in some of the bigger deals yeah. you can get involved in. And uh, he helped me get over some of those obstacles right away. And it's, uh, you know, it's been just kind of a, an incredible, wonderful interesting journey since then. One of the things I love about real estate is every single deal is different. The people are different. It, it's always something new and different to, to um, take a look at and evaluate. And especially now with the market changing, you know, people are taking, for example, the multi-unit properties and doing a lot of different things that can bring more value to multi-unit properties as compared to just renting them out as plain old apartments anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that is very true. Yeah. And honestly, that's what we were talking about before we jumped on is the just the creative aspect of of commercial real estate investing is, you know, it's kind of like the world is your oyster. You can you can structure things differently. You can add on components. You can add on amenities or different things like you mentioned, like different ways to pull in cash flow from a property. Um, you can finance things creatively. It's just it's it's very much uh, open to a lot of options and open to a lot of structures and you can get very creative with it. So I, right. that's a big part of, of what I love about it. Yeah. And then when I got started teaching in uh, 1997, one of the things that uh, we did, I've had a number of different partners through, through the years. Um, all have been incredible experiences and a great growth opportunity. And and uh, each of my partners has added just a tremendous amount to the equation along with the, the components that I would uh, contribute myself. 
But one of the things we did from early on, and I continue to do this day with the, you know, the handful of people I now work, work with personally, is I would give people two options. Either they could pay a very large sum of money and they can keep all the profits on the deals that we help them get into, or they could pay a, a, a lesser amount, much lesser amount, and agree to split the first two deals with me. And that's, that's allowed me to not just teach people, to, but to be an active partner in deals you know, all over the country. And um, I like that formula so well that, that I continue to do it today, although on a much smaller scale. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, that, that's honestly a great way to, to structure it. If, you know, it first off gives them a choice, uh, but then also brings you in if they choose that latter option of, of being much more active and, and they probably get a lot of value out of that too. Yeah, I think the only, if I could change it, the only change I would make would be I'll, I'll split your last two deals with you because people tend, <laughs> like I did, to start out small and then, you know, go bigger. Right, that's okay. right. Yeah. Yeah, yep. they, they, they're learning on the first two. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, my, my life changed uh, uh, pretty quickly um, coming up on seven years ago now where I was out racing a motorcycle, which I should have known better than to be doing that in my 50s um, and uh, should have listened to my wife. <laughs> uh, bless her heart. She, she was so against it. And I said, no, honey, it's going to be okay. I'll be all right. Anyways, I was in a, a dirt bike racing accident in a hair scrambles race in New Jersey and ended up clipping a tree, went over the handlebars, um, shattered my hip, dislocated my femur. And wow. when they were working on me in the hospital, unfortunately, they crushed the nerve in my leg, which, wow, you talk about yeah. something that, that uh, tingles. Gosh. It's crazy. When the pain goes on a scale of from 1 to 10, it goes to 200. It's absolutely amazing that your mind just finds a way to somehow deal with it. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's been uh, a long time coming back from that. In fact, I'm still working on that now. Um, I, you know, I went from hospital bed to wheelchair to walker to crutches to a cane. And a uh, couple, about two years into my injury, I just was sitting around and just watching Netflix to try and keep my mind off the pain in my leg. And I just thought, I've got to do something different. And I decided to hike the Appalachian Trail, starting out in Georgia, going over 2,000 miles all the way to Maine. And it took me 11 months spread over the course of two years to do it. Uh, it takes most people just four or five months to do it. Um, but that was just an incredible journey. And you, know, you talk about really learning and knowing the lesson of breaking something down into small daily tasks. You know, I'd wake up in my tent in the morning and know that my job that day was to make it 10 or 12 miles north. I didn't yeah. need to decide which direction to go. I knew the direction. I had a path. It was clearly marked out. I just had to make my way along that. And uh, yeah, it was an awesome experience. Got to really have a lot of time just thinking about, you know, stuff. We, we're all so rushed these days, especially yeah. with our phones and everything in front of us all the time. And I got to just spend time in the quiet of the woods, listening to the birds and the wind through the trees and just thinking about all the wonderful things that have happened in my life, times that my kids said something was funny or was really cute that I'd forgotten about, and really just being able to think back on, on uh, everything I've been blessed with. And one of the things I realized during that hike is that I had grown my education company to where I had 35 employees and 17 coaches for me. I had systematized everything. I had everything down where, uh, from a time management point of view, I was doing a great job. Uh, from uh, staying connected with the part of the business that I really loved, I realized I was doing a horrible job. I was no longer right there at the front lines helping someone, you know, when they first got started. Um, that, that's kind of the part that just still gives me a thrill this day when, you know, when someone's scared to, to get out there and make an offer, um, helping them to get over that, that hump. Um, or, you know, when the seller comes back and says that they're going to cancel your deal because they found a better offer, you know, how to deal with that. Yeah. You know, in a good way, but also to take care of your interests and stand up for what's right for you. And so, yeah. So after that hike, I, I realized that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm just going to, I'm at a point where fortunately, you know, I've, I've gone up the curve and climbed the mountain and I've sold off most all of my real estate investments now uh, to where I'm just enjoying life and I have four kids, four grandkids and two more grandkids on the way. And uh, so I do that and I do consulting with uh, people on commercial properties on a very part-time basis. 
That's amazing. And I, and I love the, the realization and the, and the time that you spend on the trail and what that meant to you. Um, and I, and I think there is some, some opportunity for our listeners to learn of like, Hey, there's, there's times where you should be getting away from your work and, and having that time to yourself and time of reflection. Do you have any advice for our listeners of, of, um, how to kind of go on a similar journey of their own, like your Appalachian Trail? Uh, well, I could, I could talk all day long about that. And it, it's probably just time-wise out of reach for most people. Um, what I have found that's similar to that is once a year, my wife and I have always gone at the beginning of the year to a nice warm place. We, we used to go down to Mexico. Um, I'm kind of a scaredy cat of, of all the, the crime that's going on down there. I do not want to be in part participating on the wrong end of a kidnapping, <laughs> um, but going, you know, someplace really nice and warm and just getting away from what you're doing every single day. It's amazing what your mind can do when it's not worried about just the most urgent, you know, putting out a fire in front of you when you can yeah. just kind of step back and, and think about the things you really want to do and come up with some concrete steps that will allow you to do that. The other thing that I found from hiking the Appalachian Trail, I found very interesting was that if I, if I looked at going, you know, 2000 miles, there's, there's no way that I could even fathom doing that. Yeah. You know, it, it, when you're, especially when you're out there and you're, you know, it's tired, you're tired, a hot day and you're getting dehydrated and going up over these, these things that you have to, you know, hold on with your hands and pull yourself up over. Uh, even when I got close, I remember when I was 500 miles from the finish and I started thinking, okay, all I've got is 500 miles, 500 miles. And then over a couple of days thinking about that, it just became overwhelming to me. My, my mind was telling me, you, you, you can't do 500 miles. You're worn out. You're tired. Your leg is killing you. Come on, you, can, you can't do that. And so what I realized that I had to do was I couldn't think about the 500 miles to go. But what I could think about was, okay, it's only three days to get to the next town where I'm going to take a break. That's all I'm going to think about. I know I can make it the next three days. I'm just going to focus on that. And by breaking it down into just those little chunks like that, it's amazing what you can accomplish. Yeah, that, that's a great lesson. Um, and, and, and I think it takes a mindset of that, like being able to believe in yourself and, and think in the short term as far as, you know, like the, there's a very similar to what you said about the Appalachian Trail. There's a, um, a, basically a story that goes if you're driving on a, you know, a very foggy road at night and you can only see eight feet in front of you, then that's all you need to focus on is that eight feet. And right. while you're making all those turns and whatnot, like just focus on one foot in front of the other, you know, make sure you're, you're making the right steps and, um, and taking those steps to, to the bigger goal, but don't right. get and scared. Even, even or, if you go slower. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, again, with, with, uh, access to all these, you know, stories on the internet. Some, some people, they, they feel like they've got to have a plan of yellow brick road that's completely laid out where they know every single step all the way through to get them to where they have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of units that they own or, or, uh, you know, different commercial properties. And it's, I, I had listened to one of the other podcasts and, and uh, one of the things that I heard on there was that, deals create deals. And I, I thought that was just a great, great idea because that's definitely true. You go out, you do even a little deal and the people you meet and the brokers and the contacts mm -hmm. and the insurance guy and, and the person at the title company and everyone that's part of that process sees that you're out there. You're actually someone that's out there doing it. And that's how you create the relationships that bring you deals that, that uh, you know, you wouldn't have known about any other way. And that's what it's all about. Right. And it, what, what, advice do you typically give to somebody trying to find or put together their first commercial real estate deal that, you know, they haven't done it before and, and they're, they're getting kind of those first deal jitters? Uh, generally, you know, it depends on, on the person. If it's someone with, with, uh, you know, limited capital, if they only have 50 or a hundred thousand dollars to get started, generally what I'm going to advise is that rather than looking for that nice a class property that they would love to own someday, they, they look more a B minus C, maybe even a D category of property. Look for a property that's been owned for a long time, generally at least 15 years. You're looking for a mom, ma and pa type owner, um, someone that's owned that property so long that they're at a point in their life where 
you know, whether that property creates more cash flow or not really doesn't make a bit of difference for them. They, they probably have all of their needs taken care of. Um, a lot of times, you know, I've met owners where they don't, they don't even have anyone in, as their heirs. They don't have a grandkid or a, a child that's interested in real estate. Right. And so this thing is just, it's like a property that's, that's been um, just not given the attention that it deserves maybe for the past five or 10 years. And generally, I found with property, if you don't give it attention, generally some of the cash flow is going to road away or it's certainly not going to keep up with what it could do as far as net operating income. And so if you can find one of these properties where the owner hasn't been aggressive on raising the rents or if they have a property management company taking care of it, guess what? If you've got a proper property management company and they're not on top of their game, they're going to take the easy route, which is just keeping the rents where they are, right? They're not going to have turnover. It's a lot easier for them to manage. They make the same amount of money in most cases. And if you can find that property where the property itself has good bones, is a good property, but it has a, a fair amount of deferred maintenance maybe, and especially that the rents are low, that is just such an easy play to go in and not only uh, buy the property, increase the rents, do, do the fix up, get it back in shape again and, and uh, do a value add play, but it's also an excellent situation, especially with someone that's older in life, to be able to put together a creative deal where either with owner carry financing or putting together a commercial master lease. We've done a number of those over the years or buying the property, leaving the existing financing in place, um, which you need to be careful with that. Uh, these days when we do those deals, we actually notify the lender and let them know what we're doing. We don't want to do anything that's not, uh, 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 we don't give notice to all the players that are involved in the project. Right. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's awesome. I was uh, working with one of my students the other day and, and uh, he had a property where this one was a, a strip center, uh, medical tenants and financial tenants, pretty, pretty decent property. Um, and, but it was a ma and pop property that had been owned for a number of years. And the reason coming from the broker, as far as they were selling, is it just ready to, you know, retire and kind of uh, be coming back down the backside of the mountain like I am. And I was telling my client that this is an excellent opportunity to maybe put something together with owner carry financing. And because people like that, they're looking a lot of times not for cash that they're going to have to go out and reinvest, but they're just looking for right. a way to have a steady income from that cash. Right. So we put together deals where by using owner carry financing, we give them basically the rate of return or even a little better rate of return they were looking for without having to go out and look for that next step. One of the things that I found that's awesome about uh, owner carry financing is that if you can put together something with a 20 or 30 year term, first off, that's better financing than most commercial financing, which has a call in five to 10 years. Plus, I, I don't want to say anything's absolute, but every, every single deal I've ever been involved in where we had a long term note like that, it turned out that at one time or another, um, that turned into a situation where either the owners passed on and then their kids wanted their money and were willing to accept a deeply discounted payoff on a note that had, you know, 17 more years to pay on it. Um, or the owners themselves, they just get to a point where they, you know, they've got a medical reason or something comes up where they want to get the cash now and get much less than um, they would get, obviously, if they waited to get their payments over time. And it's it's almost a way to get a deep discount on buying a property without having to ask for that discount up front. You know, if you get long-term financing, there's a really good chance that you're going to be able to discount that, pay that off. Uh, and what we've done on projects I've been involved in is just brought in refinancing at that point in time, because there's enough equity in the property to uh, keep the, keep the lenders happy. And it's amazing what you can do with a little bit of creativity that way. Yeah, I love that. And, and as far as the uh, commercial real estate investing for dummies, all the other books you've written, um, walk, walk us through that process of wanting to write that book and then, and then how that book has impacted the readers. Oh my goodness. The first, <laughs> the first book uh, that, that um, I wrote was called Multiple Streams of Income, How to Make Multiple Streams of Income Buying Nice Homes in Nice Areas with Little or Nothing Down. Very, very much a long title. Uh, and that first book, just like anything that you've done in life, you haven't done it before. It just seems like this huge, you know, Herculean task. It's going to be so hard to do. And then, you know, once you've done it, you realize that yes, writing a book, yes, it's a very 
focused, you know, a lot of effort. I'm actually working on a book right now about my experience hiking the Appalachian Trail and working on um, overcoming this traumatic injury that I had. And uh, I'm on the 500 words a day plan for that. Wow. Um, just like anything else, you break it down into little yeah. steps and, and chunk it out. One of the other things I found with writing a book that made it much easier is um, for most people, it's easier to sit down and talk about something that they're knowledgeable about than it is to actually put it down on paper. So one of the things that you can do is record yourself doing, doing some training or giving a talk to people about, you know, one of the chapters, the ideas in your book. And then you can get that transcribed these days through rev.com and other places so inexpensively and quickly. And a lot of times just having the ideas down like that, that won't be exactly the wording in the book, but you can look at what you've written and, and the ideas that you've expressed and, and that gets your mind enough of a foundation so that you can put together a book that really makes sense and explains in maybe much more detail than you did on the, the brief talk where you went over it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and honestly, from my personal experience, I remember there was a lot of things about owner financing, creative financing, um, and just how to structure deals. What are the right things to, to, that you should be paying or what percentages you should be paying on certain fees. Um, it, it will very much helped me when I was first, you know, understanding and, and kind of was, you know, in the dark about a lot of things about commercial real estate. Right. One of the other things that we did um, early on, we had one self-published book and we were working on writing another one. And from uh, one of my mentors, his name is Bob Allen. He wrote Nothing Down that a lot of people know of. Uh, uh, Bob told this story of how he went to the book, uh, book Expo. There's an annual book expo where all the publishers are there, all the people in the book industry. And we went there and put together this package with uh, you know, the first chapter of the book, uh, we paid we paid someone to make a, a front cover. We had titles that we had tested and had a, had a good title for the book, we thought. Um, we approached all the different publishers and said, hey, here's a complete package of everything shown in this book. Here's how many of our, our first book that we've sold already. Um, here's the marketplace. Here's the competitors. We did everything that you're supposed to do. And we actually had publishers who said, wow, this, you're the first person that's ever done all the stuff that you're supposed to do. No one ever goes to the trouble of doing all this. <laughs> and then the other thing that we did that was interesting was we talked to a couple of other people who already had books published in our industry, in the real estate education industry. And we found out from two of them um, that had deals with Dearborn Publishing, we found out exactly what the deal they had put together was. And one of the components of each of their deals was they agreed to buy a chunk of the first publishing to reduce the risk for the publisher and also to show them you're confident in the book's success. And so for our first book published through a, a real publishing house, which ended up being Dearborn, we actually bought about two thirds of the first, uh, first printing and um, had those books and actually ended up, you know, giving them out to our students either for free at seminars or, you know, selling them ourselves through the years. Uh, as our vote of confidence on, yes, this is going to be a great book and we believe in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And honestly, um, it, it's interesting, the, the whole, the book publishing process. Um, but I, I think if you're, if you're dedicated to it and you can figure it out and you, and you rely on those that have done it before you, just like anything else, finding a mentor or finding, you know, someone you can learn from, um, I think it helps tremendously. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing for those of you thinking about publishing a book is that um, a publisher will get it basically into the bookstores, which meant more years ago than it does now. Um, you know, it's pretty easy for anyone to get even a self-published book up on Amazon, but they're, they're generally not going to do much of the marketing for you. You, you still up to you as the author to get out there and do radio show interviews and, and uh, book signings and, and uh, you know, with and now, us. And now we, podcast interviews. Yeah, podcast <laughs> interviews, and uh, you know, if you're doing seminars and stuff like that, we would we would hand out four or five postcards with an, a little blurb about our book, and encourage uh, everyone that came to our seminar to hand them out to you know friends that were interested in real estate or whatever. So, um, just back to you know doing doing everything that you can, a little bit of everything. Yeah, helps. I love that. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's jump into our monumental questions. Um, what does success mean to you? 
Success to me means that you're living your life in a way where you are taking the steps to be able to do the things that you really want to do. I think it's such a shame when I, I meet people who, you know, they're, they're working a job or doing something that they hate and they're just figuring that, well, once I get to where I retire someday, this, you know, this company has a good pension plan or whatever, and I'm going to start to do the fun things, start to enjoy life at that point in time. I found that if people do that, generally more often than not, they tend to develop the habit of being unhappy and they, they stay unhappy even once they're retired. Right. Um, so having the willingness to, to explore things, even if it's on a part-time basis, to get out, whether it's real estate investing or something else, get out, get an education, learn what you can, find someone who's done it before that can work with you and, and get some of that going. Um, one of the things I've done throughout my life is I've always used what I already had going to kind of support getting the next thing going. And that's a lot easier to do if you're not, you know, spending time watching TV and, and uh, you know, just sitting there on your um, cell phone involved doing Facebook and stuff like that all day long. Nothing wrong with that for those of you into it, but um, that's probably not something that's going to take you to where you want to go financially. Yeah. And to me, true success uh, isn't the amount of money that you've made or that you have in the bank but it's what your child says to their friend when they're talking about you. Hmm. I love that. That's really cool. Um, what about daily habits or morning rituals? Daily habits for me are um, a big part of that is focused around my continuing rehab of my leg. Um, I ride my bike uh, about two hours a day uh, inside in the bad weather and outside when it's nice out. Um, I also walk in a therapy pool most every day because I found that's very beneficial to me. I am working on practicing my piano and getting it up to performance mode, which I've got a long ways to go with that, but it's <laughs> something I really enjoy. And, and uh, I like the creative aspects of that. Uh, I'm, I sound best doing improvisation as opposed to, you know, reading the notes and trying to get them timed exactly. And uh, so I, I think, Focusing on health for me has been a big thing. Um, one of the things that I did learn as part of hiking the Appalachian Trail was learning how to uh, keep my weight down. I'm actually down to my high school weight now, right now, and I'm just really excited about that. There's a lot wow. of benefits that come with that. Yeah, that's um, impressive. Another daily habit is I, I write in my journal. I just kind of uh, put down my ideas of, of, of what, I'm, what I'm feeling at the moment, what challenges I might have, and... I, I, at times, if I am going through something, I need answers. I'll just imagine that I've got this infinite teacher of wisdom out there. <laughs> and it's crazy how if you kind of step out and imagine those ideas coming from outside yourself, they're, they're coming yeah. obviously from your brain. But if you think of those ideas from coming outside yourself, what kind of things it's, you know, why don't you try this or do that? Or, you know, why are you doing that? That's, you know, not the right thing to be doing. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Uh, process to go through. Yeah, that that sounds similar. I do a, a Dr. Joe Dispenza meditation every morning, and and it walks you through that exact process of saying, "Hey, there's another version of you that already has the answer, and you're focusing on connecting with that other half and, and yeah. finding that answer that you don't know yet or but already exists." Right. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's very powerful. Um, the other thing I do each day is I make a protein shake. I've been doing this for four years now, um, except when I was hiking the Appalachian Trail, obviously. But it's uh, uh, two and a half cups of almond milk, half an avocado, uh, pro a scoop of protein powder, and a tablespoon of powdered peanut butter. That's the secret that makes it taste really good. Nice. And very low calories, very healthy. Um, put about two cups of ice in there, blend it up. And that's how I start my day. My, my grandkids all insist on having some, but they, they call it Grampy's Shake. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, what about your favorite book or book you're currently reading? Uh, favorite books, I've actually got two that I, I think are, are very helpful as far as, you know, for people that want to make changes in life and get things done. One is called The Portable Coach by Thomas Leonard, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but he was involved in the, the coaching movement. and he kind of breaks down a lot of chunks of different areas of your life and ways that you can, for example, create a reserve in your life to have an ex extra capacity that makes it easier for you to deal with challenges when they come up. The other one is a little book uh, by Michael Brooks. It's called Instant Rapport. And 
even if you just learned the, the basics of creating rapport with other people, as far as advancing in life and real estate deals, is that's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. If you can find a way to quickly become friends with somebody, yeah. you're going to find that it's, it's very, very helpful because people like to do business with people that they, they like, know, and trust. And uh, creating rapport is the first part of that. Yeah, I could not agree more. That's, that's very true. And that's the, like the first step to building the foundation for a great relationship, either business or personal or, right. or both. Right. That and asking people to talk about themselves, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, so first off, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, this has been a blast and, it, and it's really cool to, to be able to hear your story firsthand and share that with our listeners um, and, and hear how you educated people, your creative financing, your, your learning um, from the Appalachian Trail, you know, your, your stories of your getting back from that motorcycle accident. Um, so I'm really glad we're get to, getting to share this with our audience. Um, and how can our audience reach out to you or connect with you? Um, they can find me at my real estate site, which is realestate101.com. Or if there's uh, some of you out there who don't have the commercial real estate investing for dummies book yet, you can go to this website to get a free e-sample copy. It's the first four chapters of the book. And that's, that's uh, petersfreebook.com, petersfreebook.com. I love it. Guys, take them up on that. Uh, I've read that book. Uh, very insightful, very valuable. Um, great, great, great information in there. Um, and honestly, love today's episode. If, if you guys listening enjoyed today's episode, make sure to share it on social media. Uh, tag both of us. Let us know you're listening. And also, do not forget to leave a review on iTunes. Uh, leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast. And with that, have a monumental day. <laughs>